And you see the problem is the pattern doesn't change very fast, right? So that's called autocorrelation. You have to go a long time. If you want to get a new pattern that is completely new representative pattern, you have to wait a long time. That's called critical slowing down. Now, as I said, and I won't go through the, the technical details, but for the IC model and for 5 4 theory, uh, Wolf and myself and various people have done cluster algorithms. So here's what's happened when you find a cluster algorithm. That's how fast it goes. Okay. And then you can do what's called a single cluster algorithm called Wolf algorithm, where you flip one cluster at a time. This is actually ergodically faster, but notice how much faster it is. And the reason is that at a critical point, there's a whole domain that gets coherent, and that's what you want. You want a large domain, but those domains are hard to find. But in this specific algorithm, we find exactly those domains and flip them all over at once, okay? So you can see, just to emphasize it, suppose you go back to the slow algorithm and you see what happens when you try to order it. You see how, how this is now an ordered phase, it should all be down. And you see only things that are doing, changing are on the boundaries because those are the only spins that are sort of ambiguous. They have some up neighbors and some down neighbors and they love to flip, but all the stuff that is completely Democrats talking to Democrats, they don't want to flip. And all the Republicans that are talking to Republicans, they don't want to flip. So that's the reason it's slow. You see how slow this is? So uh, for, unfortunately, we don't know cluster algorithms for almost every theory, but we do know it for the theories that we're gonna discuss. So everything we did on this was done on a laptop, basically, because we had these fast algorithms. Okay, so now let me go back to the, the problem. So, but I just thought I should show you, we can discuss how these algorithms work, but you can see that this is the slow algorithms. This, by the way, hybrid Monte Carlo is equal to self, okay? It's all, it's, 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 um, it's, it's a problem that nobody knows really how to solve in general. If you, if you have a good idea, uh, you can join the, um, the group uh, doing uh, algorithmic research. Oops, I gotta get rid of this thing. Oh, shoot. Sorry. Sorry. Now I've, uh, God, oh gosh, my computer's frozen. See, it's a good thing I got plenty of time. I'm gonna see if I can get rid of this thing. Kill it. Brutal force. Okay, so so anyway, so let me now go to the, the, the problem at hand, which is um, you know, we could have easily uh, permuted the order for um my talk and Cameron's. The problem is to figure out, you see, lattice gauge theory. In fact, almost all field theories are done on regular grids, usually cubic grids, in flat space. It turns out, and you could already see this in Cameron's talk, that particularly conformal theories have extra symmetries. And there's a magical property of these extra symmetries is that you can solve it in flat space and get everything you want to know. But there's so much symmetry that you can also put it on a sphere and get exactly all the same information in everything you know. And it's because the sphere and the flat space is really conformally the same space. You're not used to that in flat space with only translations and rotations, you say, okay, that's the best you can do. You move around that flat space. And that's what happens when you don't have a conformal theory, you just have what's called Lorentz invariance or Poincare invariance, okay? But if it's conformal, there's a whole set of spaces that are absolutely equivalent and you can map every single piece of information from a plane to a sphere to a cylinder. So, but they're privileged, beautiful spaces. Fortunately, uh, those spaces are really things with positive curvature, that's called a sphere, zero curvature, that's called a plane, we, we always do that, and negative curvature, constant negative curvature, that's called any the sitter space. These are special spaces, they're the same everywhere, they have a lot of symmetry, they're called Einstein spaces by some people. They're called maximally symmetric spaces by other people. But obviously, spheres and planes are not simple. And actually, so is any sitter space. It's just a change in the sign of the um, curvature. So, those, so, although this talk is going to try to figure out how do you deal with curved manifolds, but in reality, these are the ones I care about because they're actually ones that are important for physics. Okay. So, okay, here's a group of people just to show that uh, I don't do this alone. This is a, a postdoc that's just joined BU from uh, Brookhaven. Uh, he's uh, already working strongly with Cameron and I to try to get codes going so that we can do a lot of different problems. Okay, so, all right. So let's go back to the talk that was given on 5-4 theory, because really 
as in almost everything, you use 543 as the standard problem to, to practice on. Okay. And we had a nice talk by students, which was really beautiful. And so 543 is this Lagrangian. It has a derivative term. It has a 5 fourth that you square it out. I wrote it this way, and it has a mass term, and I made the mass term negative so that it would be double well. Now, the magic of putting up the lattice is that the lattice is only a superstructure which you build in order to get to the answer by going to a limit where the lattice spacing looks small. If that weren't the case, you would never be able to do anything with lattice theories. And the other really fantastic thing is that there's a property called universality. And that is there's a zillion different ways to build a microscopic lattice, which when you go to long distances, yield exactly the same theory. So that's why this is a huge thing of research. What is the best microscopic theory that gets you as quickly as possible at long distances to the right theory that you're interested in the jargon, the long distance is called infrared, long wavelength, and the lattice is called ultraviolet. But the ultraviolet disappears. So this means you can choose your medicine. A huge number. They haven't, we haven't even begun to find the vocabulary of different ways to do the same theory on a lattice. Uh, Stat Mac people do this all the time. They take some messy crystal piece of material. They don't care about the material if they are field theorists, they say, oh, there's an effective theory at a long distances and it might be a supersymmetric theory. They can build all kinds of effective theories with different lattices. The same thing is for quantum computing. We can build all sorts of quantum systems, which will be the same at long distances. So this universality is a magic wand. And it, it's, uh, now in the particular case of this case, the two theories that I wanna think about is the five fourth theory and the IC model. And the icing model, it was already explained. In 5-4 theory, you think about the potential being like this. But then you say, oh, well, I'm really only interested in one feature. I'm interested in the feature where those blobs that I showed you grow. And those blobs grow because this double well becomes shallow enough that this thing starts flipping you back and forth between the wells. And universality is the statement that if I call one well minus one and the other well plus one, at a microscopic level, if it flips back and forth quickly enough, you don't even know that it's not 543. Okay? So the icing model is simply the characterization of this theory where you say there's only two states. There's a state in the right well and the left well. And your universality is not easy to prove, but it's known that this is exactly the same theory in long distances. Okay? So although we started this thing off mostly doing 54 theory, I'm going to tell you how the advantage was to go to the icing model, but you shouldn't have viewed these things as different theories. Um, by the way, we, we had, you had this question about zero mass. This is zero mass quadratic form. This is a conformal theory and the thing can just rock it back and forth here. Okay. So anyway, so I am doing five, four theory or the icing model, and I consider them to be the same theory, but with really different technical advantages, uh, depending on what you're trying to do. Okay. So. Anyway, so now let me just tell you, I showed you one video, but I, I put this in the slides because um, this, this guy is a Princeton student, PhD student, and he's got all kinds of videos for everything you've ever thought of looking at. Let me see if I can show you. Um, so, but I mean, just, just you know, to show you that this, there's more than, oh, gosh, let me see if I can get this. It's not showing. I have to uh, figure out how to do this. Okay. But let me actually go to this page here. Oh, I, uh, now I've screwed myself up in terms of sharing. Uh, what do I do? I thought it was going to uh, shift to the thing. Well, anyway, let me just tell you, okay, maybe if I do this, you'll like to be able to slide it. Ah, yeah, okay, good. You see it now? Do you, do you see this guy's page? Well, when you have some time and you're relaxing uh, in the evening, look at this. The point is that he has gotten, he's looked at all kinds of videos for theories. This is the IC model. That's the one I did. Uh, there is a tricritical IC model, which uh, Joel has been uh, pushing me to do forever because it's actually a supersymmetric version of the IC model. Then there's POTS models. I, I, all of these are similar models of transitions, and he has simulations for them all. 
Um, so uh, look at it. It's wonderful. Um, he's uh, much smarter doing videos than I am. Uh, but I, I, it, it, it isn't silly to do the videos. You will get a real sense of what the videos are showing you what Monte Carlo was doing. Okay. So if you look at them, you'll get a real sense of what Monte Carlo was really doing rather than looking at equations. Okay. So anyway, I just point that out. Now, it turns out that, um, as I said uh, this morning, that um, all in conformal theories, all propagation, even in Euclidean space, doesn't go down exponentially. It goes as a power. And just to show you how easy it is to do it, if you do this and find the leading power in the IC model, this is the exact, well, the exact answer is uh, one eighth, okay? And this is a very small laptop calculation, decent one. And this is the value for this thing. That's the analog of finding a mass in a massive theory. This is the exponent for the power of follow up. So these are very powerful methods. People would love to find such accuracy in QCD, okay? But this is two dimensions and it has cluster algorithms. So, uh, you know, it's a lovely place to uh, learn and actually get very strong answers. I mean, we got this thing right to, um, Four decimal places, basically, and and it wasn't a large calculation. You can do it on your laptop. I can send you the code. So anyway, so that's the um, that's the advantage of being small. This so now let me get to the the heart of the problem. What if we have a manifold which isn't flat? Well, at a Lagrangian level, there is a wonderful thing called the metric tensor. How many people uh, are familiar with this? What it means is that the derivatives that you put into the Laplacian have to be um, uh, formed by the inverse metric tensor. And this is a volume term, okay? So this theory is the phi four theory on any manifold with metric G. Now, if you put it on a lattice, what used to be nice constant coordinates, constant hops along the uh, square lattice turn into some fan, oops, Turn, turn into some fancy constants. Mm -hmm. So the question that we have is when are these constants going to converge to the metric here? So if this was a sphere, how do we adjust these constants to make sure that when we run the computer, we look at long distances, it indeed looks like a sphere or anything we want. So you see now what we have is we have a problem really with two kinds of fields. The metric tensor is after all the field, that's the field of general relativity. It's, to, it's the gauge field of general relativity, in fact, okay? It's exactly um, related, well, it's related basically to F mu nu, it's the curvature tensor, okay? So we have to worry about geometry at the level of this, and then we have to put the field on it and see if everything fits together. And what happens is, is basically the story I wanna say, okay? So here is the example that we started with and, and Cameron mentioned it. If we want to put something on a sphere, it's kind of obvious what to do. You start with the icosahedron. As he said, that's the best you can do with equilateral triangles. Then you turn on Mathematica. Well, first of all, you do is you, you, you draw lines in this thing and you make a triangular lattice here and a triangular lattice here and here and here. But if you do that, notice you're not on a sphere. You're on a tetrahedron, an icosahedron. So in order to make it look like a sphere, you sit in the middle and you blow up the triangles onto the sphere. When you do that, although it looks pretty regular, these triangles here are not the same as the triangles toward the poles. The ones in the middle get stretched a little bit, right? The ones at the pole. And one thing you can see that is peculiar is these triangles meet in five ways. That's the only way you could get this to turn into a sphere, a sphere-like topology, because that has a, a curvature singularity. And so there are places where there are five, but all the rest of the places are, are sixfold. So this uh, sphere is a good approximation to the geometry. And I will explain that that's what's actually called Reggie geometry, okay? It was done in 1960, before Wilson invented lattice gaze theory, basically. Uh, but this is not absolutely uniform. And so you could say, oh, well, you know, it's good enough. What's, what's, why should I be worried about it? The, the answer is that it's absolutely good enough if we do classical physics. So if we wanna look at the classical limit of a quantum field theory on this surface, 
and we do classical physics, we're then solving the partial differential equations of the equations of motion. Doing classical physics on a manifold like this has a name which goes back for a generation called finite element methods. It's one of the standard methods of computational physics and engineering. You can do classical equations on any manifold you want, so long as you, what you say, tessellate it finely enough with the right triangles in 2D. And in higher D, you have to have, um, I'll explain, you have to have more complicated volume things, okay? But the point is that using this kind of manifold is good for classical physics. Now, the reason that I'm actually uh, so um, optimistic about this program is that only after working on this for about five years did it finally dawn on me with the help of this graduate student, who, by the way, was supposed to talk, but I'm play replacing him, Evan Owen. We did some experiments, numerical experiments, and it finally dawned on us that this question of classical versus quantum physics is easily seen to be the same problem for gravity as for quantum field theory. And at the classical level, Reggie introduced lattices, they're called simplicial lattices, in, the, in 2D that we'll call them triangulated lattices. So you can take any surface and make it triangulated. We showed that, um, uh, Cameron showed how to do it in negative curvature space. I'm doing it in positive curvature space, but you can literally do it anything. You take a, a rugby ball and you put enough triangles on it and you can get a rugby ball, okay? That works for classical gravity. And in fact, is one of the methods that's used for numerical relativity, for example, to do black holes. It works for classical PDEs. However, it doesn't work in quantum physics, okay? Quantum physics has another problem. And there's many ways to see this problem, but let me just sort of, uh, uh, okay. Yeah, so the, the, the problem, the way we first noticed it was the following. Suppose that we use this uh, expanded triangulation of the sphere. We ran phi four theory on it, and we looked at the value of phi squared around the sphere. And sure enough, you can see that it was a tetrahedron, even though it's been stretched out and made pretty good, it's hot spots and cold spots are in different places. So why is this happening? It's happening because quantum theory fluctuates on all scales. It, it's, it's called the ultraviolet problem. When you have a quantum wave in Fourier space, it goes down to the shortest possible distances. And those distances are, those short distances are called divergences, which you have to handle. But it measures, Quantum physics measures the exact geometry at the shortest distance. And that geometry is not quite right from a quantum point of view. It's completely okay from a classical point of view because classical solutions are smooth, but quantum solutions are rough and they can't not be rough. If they're not rough, it's not quantum physics, okay? So what's happening is that when you run the Five, four, three, which is a very simple thing. We did it, we put it on the sphere, we ran the code, we looked at it and said, what is the average field strength uh, squared here? And it's lumpy, it's not good, okay? So it fails in quantum physics. So the first thing we did, which I'm not gonna talk about uh, a great deal, we spent most of the time beginning with five, four theory and tried to figure out how to correct these um, lumpiness. And it turned out that what you have to do is you have to move the mass term uh, in different ways across the sphere. And we got guided by that by looking at perturbation theory. So there was, we got good results this way, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift to a more geometrical interpretation, which allows me to do the IC model, which I think is, is, a, is a breakthrough. But anyway, so the point is this didn't work. So uh, here's my cartoon. If you don't know anything about this talk, this is it. Classical Reggie and classical uh, finite element uh, field theory is on one side and quantum field theory is on the other side and they have to agree on the geometry. And they don't naturally agree that you can take a classical triangulated space, use all of Reggie's skill to say, you know what the manifold is, then you throw a quantum theory on it and it starts to oscillate back and forth 
And even if you get it to converge and don't get these lumps, you'll discover that it doesn't have the geometry you thought it was. So this is a, the only reason that people have not noticed this in lattice gauge theory is if you start with a square lattice, there was so much symmetry because you could translate each square to another square that you could guess the geometry. And that ultraviolet divergences did not upset you. This is a whole thing called operator product expansion or relevant terms. It's well understood. It's being, been studied for a generation. That if the thing is regular enough, then you don't have this problem. But if, it, if it's irregular in the slightest degree, just slightly irregular, it says, oh, I don't like the geometry you think you have. I'm going to find my own geometry. And so you have this tug of war. So here's, here's the, so now, by the way, I'm going to only talk about quantizing the fields, not quantizing gravity. That's an unsolved problem. But clearly this problem comes up even more robustly if we try to quantize both the field and the metric. But we're going to do a smooth manifold, but we already have the problem of matching the quantum field to it. So here's my uh, uh, big, big uh, thing. You can spend the rest of your career doing this. Okay, Einstein's gravity triangulated, or it's actually called simplicial, was solved by Reggie in 1960. You can prove that you get the Einstein equations by taking the limit of a triangulated space. Classical theory is called finite elements. It's been solved. If you Google it, you'll find probably 10 million uh, uh, examples of it. Engineers, physicists, chemists, and so on have been using it. This classical thing is known, but what we didn't realize, at least I didn't realize, is that the geometrical description of both these is identical. So it wasn't, so these fit together uh, very nicely. If you're, a, if you're a high energy physicist and you want to understand both gravity and field theory, okay? So it turns out that the triangulation rules here and the triangulation rules here, I'm calling them triangles because it's 2D, but when you get the higher dimensions, you have to put together tetrahedrons and various other stuff, okay? Now, quantum, quantize, quantizing gravity Nobody knows how to do it. There is a beautiful idea that you can triangulate it first and then let, let the triangles wiggle around, and that will quantize the, the metric. This is still very questionable whether this is the right way to go. Now, what we're going to do instead is just quantize the field, and this is what we call uh, quantum finite elements. You have to do quantum versions of finite elements. So we can we can take the rigid classical field and the rigid classical, uh, um, sorry, rigid classical geometry. It's a sphere, we fix it. And then we can take the classical equations and quantize them down here. So we're gonna work in this thing. Uh, I, I invite you to work in this square here. You may do it in your lifetime, we don't know. It's very doubtful that we understand this. So this is part of the geometrical problem. It is the, it is the easiest part, but it turns out to not be as easy as we thought. So you take a given surface, fix it. It's an ADS surface or it's a sphere surface, whatever surface you like. You make a nice geometrical description of it. You fix it, you nail it down. Then you put the lattice variables on it. You write a code and you see whether it works. And if, you, if you're successful, you get the right answer here. Now, how do you know whether it's successful? Well, fortunately, in conformal field theory, there are exact solutions for this. So the conformal field theories are interesting anyway, but certainly they're interested as a toy because when you're trying to do something which hasn't been done before, it's very reassuring to know the answer, <laughs> okay? So the icing model is the classic soluble quantum field theory in the infrared. And it's got exact answers. It's been developed for a hundred years. There's more mathematics than you can ever you drown in. But the fact is, we absolutely know the answer. So we use this as the test case. If it doesn't agree with the exact answer, we know we made a mistake. The interesting thing is we finally got, we finally succeeded to get agreement with the exact answer. So here's, here, here we go. All right, so that, although this is sort of, okay, I'm sorry, this is just uh, more stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll, I, I can describe in questions a little bit more how Reggie thinks about geometry. It is actually very uh, interesting and, and not that hard to understand, but. I'll, I'll postpone that. I'll just assume we've got the geometry fixed. Okay, so um, all right. So let's think a little bit about how you deal now with triangulation. Well, like I guess I do have a little bit of this. So here is a 
a slightly curved surface, right? And if obviously we can put triangles on this surface where each of these points lie on the surface. Then what Reggie says is let's consider each of these points to be nailed to the surface we're trying to approximate. But let's consider all these edges to be straight lines. They don't look straight, but they are, okay. And let's consider the this like a soap bubble that all the area inside the triangle is exactly flat. So Reggie's statement is that a geometry can be approximated by points on the manifold plus flat surfaces between them, exactly flat. Now, what does that mean? If it's exactly flat, how does it curve? The answer is that if you look at one of these points where all of the triangles come together and you walk yourself around this triangle, and you ask yourself how you're rotating around that, you find that you do not go through 360 degrees. You have a def so-called deficit angle. In fact, that is the geometrical definition of a curvature tensor in general relativity. It's called parallel transport. It has the same sense that if you want to measure the gauge theory field on a lattice, you go around a square and find out whether you come back to the same gauge field. And so that's why that's the curvature tensor of gauge fields. The curvature tensor here is a metric tensor. And so you go around this uh, thing. Notice that this is flat, so that you have no trouble going flat, going perpendicular to this edge. You just, you just drop a line from this to edge. When you get to this edge, it's still flat. You, you may, in your head, think of it as being bent over. But intrinsically, it looks just flat. I mean, it just goes over. You know, remember that geometry is not the space you put it into, it's the space you live in, right? A bug, a bug on the on the surface of a sphere knows that it's on a sphere without having to look out and see that the sphere uh, is is um is uh, somewhere else. That was the whole uh Riemann Einstein awareness that geometry really can be thought of as intrinsic. So anyway, this bug says I sit here, actually it says this was called a circumcenter, it drops a line perpendicular to here, goes to another circumcenter drops a line here to another certain center, drops a line here and here. Every time it turns this corner, it measures its angles. And you can show that the sum of the winding angles around that, if it's zero, there's no curvature here. If it's positive, well, it depends how you sign. It's positive curvature and you're on a sphere or you're approximating a sphere. If it's negative, you're in ADS space. So, all of this stuff is completely general of whether you do positive curvature or negative curvature. So this is piecewise geometry. Now, the interesting thing is that finite elements does the same thing. It takes a triangular lattice, I made it look sort of flat here, and it changes the fields to piecewise slabs on top of that. So the field value here uh, is you, you define the fields going out of it, it's called the um, fiber in, the, in, in geometry. You define the field values there, and then that contributes to the field linearly falling to zero around that hexagon. So piecewise linear fields on top of a piecewise linear geometry is in fact the, form, the formulation we have. And so there's only one geometry and two piecewise linear approximations. One is a piecewise linear approximation to the metric, and the other is a piecewise linear approximation to the field. And that's sort of the fundamental starting point for the, and as I say, these are both classical notions. They both have been worked out in gory detail, and uh, the literature is not easy. We have papers which, at least to me, <laughs> explain it better, but that depends on, on your thing. Okay, so now, having said all these general things, I was I was intrigued by I, last summer. I spent a long time trying to learn more geometry than I knew in my lifetime, and I I, uh, I succeeded ten percent. I mean, I read I, I let us say I understood ten percent of what I read, uh, but uh, I I bumped into this wonderful um, uh, gentleman David Hilbert. You may have heard of Hilbert space, okay, and he is a wonderfully smart mathematician of his generation. He's got books you should read. If you read them, they like, um, you know, just open your eyes to mathematics without getting overwhelmed with uh, formalism. But 
he had this thing which he says about mathematicians, but he, you know, at that in his day, mathematicians and physicists were the same, right? So we can strike out mathematics. He says, the art of doing, I'll say physics, consists of finding a special case which contains all the germs of generality. I think you should really take this to heart. Let, let, let me open up questions. Why, why do I think that's so important? I want some feedback. I mean, I've sort of been saying it. Um, I think uh, when I read that text, it kind of reminds me of how when people found out that you can map percolation to easing model, the whole of cluster algorithms opened up. Yes. So it's kind of like these specific instances, you find the pattern in which they complement one another yes. and you could come up with general methods. That's right. So, so there's two things. What we're doing is again using the ISIN model because the ISIN model is the model that people go to in so many times <laughs> to try to have a specific example. Now, the tricky thing about it is the ISIN model has all kinds of special properties. Of course, they're great because you get the exact answer in a zillion ways. The problem is to find the germ of generality that has a chance of being generalized. Right? So, I mean, we can solve the icing model in ways which are never going to help us writing numerical programs and doing uh, lattice gauge theory. So, we have the icing model as this model to show that if we take a method which we could use more generally, can we also get the icing model? Right? So, it's, it's two things. One is to have a specific case to make sure that you're not making a mistake. But the other is to use methods which are not dependent on knowing the answer, okay? Do, do you understand my point? See, not everything could be solved analytically. So if you take an analytic model, you may be um, lulled into the idea, by the way, string theorists have done this too much, too often, into thinking all I have to do is learn analytic methods and I'm done. No, that means that you only solve the problems which can be solved analytically, which is very interesting, right? But if you ever want to do a problem like QCD, which can't be solved analytically, you must extract those methods which generalize and be, can be put on a computer or done more in other methods, right? So it's, it's both the specific thing that checks your answer and it's the generality which you want to take away. So what I'm going to show you is that we discovered by looking at a very simple case of the IC model, the importance of a stretching the lattice, which is called an affine transformation. And Evan and I and our, my colleagues gradually think that we've discovered the general principle which might work in other fields. Okay. Now we could be wrong. So, <laughs> uh, but I want to try to convince you that we've discovered we solved the icing model using this principle. And I want to try to convince you that it's likely that it's more general. And that's the reason I started reading all this geometry because I wanted to find out what was underneath this method. And then, by the way, it's still, we still don't understand. We're still experimenting with it. Uh, Cameron and I and Nobioki are actually going to run some codes in the next few weeks to see whether our guesses are, are working on the geometric level, even though we already have the answer. We're going to try to ask whether the principles are there. Okay. So anyway, I, I think this is a very wise statement. You should keep it, I'm going to keep it pinned on the blackboard <laughs> so I remember it. Um, Okay, so anyway, um, all right, let me, let me, um, let, let me go, let me go forward a little bit. I, it's, it's hard to know what order. Now, let me, let me go back to try and get a lattice. This is a square lattice if you drop the red lines, right? I just put the red lines in for fun. But you see, even a square lattice is in fact a triangular lattice. All I have to do is draw these red lines. Now, you may choose to write a field which only has derivatives, finite differences across the black lines. That's your choice. But the, the geometry is always a simplicial geometry. Okay. And furthermore, if I take this uh, lattice and I pull it, I, I pull it, uh, I, I expand it this way and pull it this way, it turns into this lattice. Now, this is a triangular lattice. What's happened is I have to have the triangles now in order to keep track of the geometry because you see, the only reason I knew the length of this thing was that this was a right angle. 
But in the triangular lattice, I don't want to know that. I just want to have all the geometry and the lengths. So if this triangle, if I tell you the length of this edge and the length of this edge and the length of this edge, that defines the geometry. I don't have any angle variables. So the advantage of triangulation and its generalization to high dimensions is that all geometry is in lengths. Uh, and in fact, um, Reggie's paper, which I only read recently, is called Einstein Equations um, Without Coordinates. Because his, his definition of geometry is a set of points and lengths. That's it. There are no coordinates. Okay. There are simply points and lengths. Now, the triangle is a unique two dimensional object, which is completely defined by its lengths. Right? Th this thing, this square is not defined by its length. It could be a parallelogram. So, this square cannot be defined uh, by its lengths. So the thing about a triangle and what is called a simplex, it's a unique object, which is totally rigid. So in two dimensions, it's a triangle. In three dimensions, it's a tetrahedron. You put another point up and then it has six lengths. And once you know all of the edges of a tetrahedron, you know it. So the point is you can encode geometry uniquely in lengths, so long as you use these things that are called simplices. That was my, um, that was my first uh, picture here. These are simplices. A, a zero simplex is a point. <laughs> okay. A one simplex is a line. It's clearly defined by the length. A two simplex is a triangle. A three simplex is a tetrahedron. And if you've got a good imagination, you can you can think of what a four simplex is. Actually, it's all you have to do is add another point and draw everything to it. So these are the unique geometrical objects in which once you've said that you have the lengths and it's flat within it, you have defined everything. And that's what Reggie realized, okay? And it's what finite element people realized, okay? They realized it in, without talking to each other. So, uh, so the point is that um, uh, that's what we want to do. We want to, um, we want to use triangles. Now, the thing about this, this statement is that it's all flat, so all of this curvature has to be singularities. So this is uh, not a smooth lattice. It's got a point delta function curvature. But see what happens is if you make more and more triangles, then this becomes smoother and smoother and all the delta functions become smaller and smaller. So it becomes a distribution of delta functions. By the way, you would think this is not smooth, but it's actually smooth enough for the Lagrangian. Uh, that's a question of actually, finite element people like to do all kinds of more fancy things, but this is fancy enough. Okay, so anyway, so, um, now, what's this got to do with, um, with this transformation here? I, I say I take a square lattice and I can transform it into this triangular lattice. Actually, if I tilt it enough, I can make this into regular triangles. So you see the square lattice and the regular triangular lattice are two endpoints of a stretching uh, formation. The technical word for that stretching is called affine transformation. Okay. Uh, again, this is something uh, when uh, Evan and I were getting numerical results, we suddenly discovered the word affine. I had to go look it up. Okay. But the answer is that the standard symmetries are translations and rotations. That's called Poincare transformations. And then affine transformations are the stretching and, and similarity transformations. So the additional transformations are to stretch X and Y and go to see this is. By the way, somebody asked whether this was a um, brevet lattice. This is a brevet lattice. You have two, this is two unit vectors that gets to everything, and these are two skewed vectors that get to everything, right? So it's defined by two lattice vectors, but if they're at arbitrary length and arbitrary angle. And that skewing is called an affine transformation. But what's more of the point is the metric is exactly an affine transformation at each point. So here, here is the affine transformation. This is the one piece of math which I, you got to go home and probably do it yourself. An affine transformation is a general linear transformation from one. This is uh, you know uh, x y z some some flat space. This is a d by d uh, matrix, a general matrix, right? It's not a rotation. This is the new thing, and this is a translation. So what does it include? Well, the translations are part of Poincaré, 
And if I restrict this thing to a rotation, it's also a part of Poincaré because in Euclidean space, the Poincaré invariance is translations and rotations. And then Kowski space, one of the rotations becomes a boost, but it's the same, okay? But you see this matrix is larger. So this matrix actually has, uh, has D plus D plus one over two additional variables. And those additional variables, if you look at the delta, if you look at the change in distance and you take the dot product, you can actually show that these are exactly the metric tensor. So in other words, the affine transformation is the way to take a regular space and turn it into a metric space. Now, the thing about general relativity is it does it as a different metric space at each point. It's not a global symmetry. It's not a global transformation. They make a separate affine transformation at each point. And in fact, that's why it's called the affine connection. <laughs> Okay, so all of general relativity is the statement that, and, and, and in general relativity, a statement, you see, this is a metric. I, I should have written this gene you knew. These are called variable metrics. I should have written this as gene you knew. All of general relativity says that if you give me gene you knew, I will tell you everything about the geometry. But locally, at each point, it is simply a stretching and rotation. And this is a, a well known fact to geometers, um, only discovered by my group very recently, I guess, <laughs> we're slow. Okay, so, so but in other words, we can actually ask this question, a part of our question, by just asking the question, if we're in flat space, what happens if we make it a global affine transformation? We're, we're dropping down to a very simple problem. I said, I wanted to be in curved manifolds. And then I said, oh, well, the heck with being on curved manifolds. Um, I will simply ask the question of how I take a triangular or a square lattice and skew it by an affine transformation, and can I still solve the problem? That is a very small part of the problem, but it turns out enough, I think, what we showed it was enough to solve it on the sphere. So let me show you what happens if we just simply think of not just square lattices. See, we're not going to do the extremes of, oh, sorry. Where is it? Yeah, we're not going to do the extremes of a square lattice or the extremes of a regular triangular lattice, we're gonna think of every lattice in between. So how do we do that? So we have to set up an IC model that can, is capable of coping with that. And the answer is, here's the IC model. Now, here's something which then, this is where the geometry becomes a, 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 an issue. This is a triangular lattice, forget about the, uh, just the black dots. Now, I've written this thing as if it was equilateral triangles. But you should not think that you know that it's equilateral triangles. All you know is that there's an icing model with K1 constant here, the beta critical, if you like, and K2 here and K3 here. In other words, there are three axes, K1, K2, K3. It is a translationally invariant la lattice. It translates this way, you translate this way, and you translate this way. It's a Brevet lattice. And it has three couplings. And we write down a quantum field theory, in this case, the IC version of it. Notice, I have not told you anything about distances. I've just told you that there's an action. So the question you have is, can we solve this IC model and go to the long distance and discover what it likes for its geometry? I gotta stop here, this is really important. This, by the way, if you find this, uh, um, you know, sort of like trying to <laughs> walk and chew gum at the same time, I, I appreciate it. <laughs> this is a very subtle thing. You write down a lattice. Everybody has always thought when they wrote down a lattice on, the, on a square lattice, they always say to themselves, oh, we have an equal lattice spacing on each of the edges. That was a, not true. That was a result, not an assumption. If you make the couplings the same on all of the edges on a square lattice, indeed, you will, in the end of the day, be able to assign a uniform edge length to all the edges. But you had to show that. And in fact, it, it's kind of a miracle because, you know, you didn't have all the symmetries. You only had translations by units and you had only rotations by 90 degrees. So it was certainly not obvious that when you took uh, a theory on a square lattice, 
and you go and look at long distances that it was rotationally invariant and translationally invariant. So now it's even less obvious. If I have three different couplings here, and if I can find the continuum theory, I don't, what is the geometry? It's got to be encoded in these constants here somewhere, if it's working at all. And the answer actually, uh, in a sense, after the fact, kind of leaps at you. These three Ks are exactly the number of parameters needed to define the affine transformation. The affine transformation is in two dimensions, it scales it, you can scale the size, and it can stretch it in two axes. So those are three parameters. So, with, you know, after the fact, we kind of realize, oh, this is what we need. We need enough parameters to account for an affine transformation. And if we do, we, we can find the new geometry. So I'm going to stop. Does, do people realize this is, a, by the way, we, we certainly didn't realize this in the beginning. So it's not obvious, okay? But by the way, this uh, uh, general uh, triangular um, icing model has been solved. It's, it's uh, got to do, you know, everything in the icing model has been solved. <laughs> okay. So the exact solution is not for this. So anyway, we can solve this theory either numerically, which we did, and, and analytically, which we did, and we can ask what the solution is. So here's the solution. So here, here's just this, this, my, my point. What how it turns out is that on a square lattice, if you look at the correlation from the origin out, as I said, it's a power behavior. And on a square lattice, you'll discover that if you go close enough to the uh, conformal theory, it will be x squared plus y squared. It's just the Euclidean distance from the center. Spherical symmetry magically comes out of the lattice in that limit, even though it only was a square lattice. And by the way, it's also true in a triangular lattice. And that's because rotations by 90 degrees were enough. And in the case of the triangular lattice, rotations by 60 degrees were enough. But in this general action with K1, K2, what happens is you actually get not a circle, but an ellipse and your, your uh, correlation will look like this. So this is a general ellipse. It's a quadratic form, an ellipse uh, you know, centered at the origin, okay? Now, it turns out that's exactly what affine transformations do. Affine transformation takes circles into ellipses. And they actually, by the way, also take parallel lines into parallel lines. So to go back to my lattice, you can see affine transformations will change the lengths, but it will keep parallel lines. So it will look like my tilted lattice. So this thing is secretly a tilted lattice in the plane. And the coupling constants will tell you how to unravel that secret. And the answer is, here is the secret. If this were a free theory, you know, it's doing finite elements. Let's say some people were asked, what about a quadratic theory? This is quadratic, okay? So as I said, a quadratic theory is a really simple test case. It's a, it's a conformal theory, has no mass. This question was asked. So that's uh, a quadratic theory. It's really differential equations in disguise. Then the answer is that the lengths that you apply to the edges, the K1 coupling applied to the one edge is this ratio, and I'll explain what the L star is in a second. And then the this thing is this ratio, and this is this ratio. So if you solve this problem and find out um, whether it looks like Coulomb's law, or, or actually, um, yeah, in three dimensions it'll be Coulomb's law, and two dimensions it'll be logarithmic. And if you want to have it be circles, you discover that you have to match the coupling constants to these lengths, which I'll describe. Remarkable thing is it can solve the icing model and you get a similar, but not the same relation. You discover that the cinch of 2K is this same value and the cinch of two, the cinch of 2K1, the cinch of 2K2 is this value, the cinch is this value. So you see the geometry is general, but the solution is not because this is weak coupling, actually zero coupling in the land in the thing. And this is strong coupling. And the only way we knew that this was the answer is because we could solve the theory. And we wrote down all of the equations of icing model and kept 
cranking around until we found out this was true. And it's due to the fact that the, uh, the actual trick was, well, I'll, I'll tell you a little about the trick. But the point is, you see, the geometry is somehow um, still there underneath the hood, but the actual dynamics that tells you how to, uh, how to twiddle the coupling constants to match the geometry is something you have to um, discover. Now, this would seem hopeless uh, in a theory that we couldn't solve, but we believe that no matter what the theory is, it will be the question of finding three constants. So it's not an infinitely complicated problem, right? So we believe that we can take any theory, any of your favorite field theories in two dimensions, we can solve it on a square lattice or a triangular lattice. And then if we want it on the affine lattice, we only have to look at a three parameter space. And we can do that numerically. And in fact, we did it, to, actually we discovered these things partially numerically and partially analytically. I, I can't think actually we sort of knew them numerically before we knew them analytically. But the point is that the lesson, now the, the germ of generality is the statement that there are only three constants that allow us to solve any model on an affine lattice. I, I, I should probably say that a little carefully, any scalar model, if we start to have vectors and so on, there'll be more constants because things have more constant, more fancy relations. But, but basically, this is the general, this is our statement. Because this is true in two cases, <laughs> You see how um, reckless I am? Because it's two in two cases, but be also because we kept thinking about the geometry, we believe this is a general theorem. And not only that, we believe it's basically general in higher dimensions. So here's the problem if students can get to us. It's trying some things to see whether we're right or wrong. Listen, if we show you're right, we'll be happy with you. If you show we're wrong, we'll fire. No, we'll also be happy because we don't want to make mistakes. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, clearly, uh, two cases does not prove it, although the geometry, I think, is very appealing. And we're going to try other cases. And we're going to try to develop the tools. But the, the basic thing that makes us optimistic is that in this plane, it is a finite set of parameters. And we actually now, even because of a really wonderful, uh, we had a, uh, we, we, we wrote this up and sent it to a journal. And the referee, first of all, liked the paper. But he explained, why don't you explain in the conclusion your, your, the general idea that you did? And his suggestion was better than our explanation. <laughs> and so we rewrote this paragraph at the end, and I, I really want to find this person because I realized that he understood our paper better than we did. <laughs> okay. He actually sort of vaguely explained all this geometry in a very uh, appealing way. He tried to relate the fact that the metric is conjugate to the energy momentum tensor and a lot of deep stuff which we had been sort of thinking about. But the more I thought about answering his thing, the more I realized this guy understands our paper better than we did. So some of my referees are very useful. Okay, so anyway, let, let's, let me just now describe. So, the, but the point, the point is that affine transformations are very special. They take parallel lines into parallel lines. They take circles into ellipses. They also don't change proportions. If you have a line that is divided in half, then it's exactly divided in half uh, in the affine transformation. That's the reason translation invariance keeps up. You see, the, if you want translation invariance, this is one jump and one jump. After the affine transformation, it still has to be one jump and one jump. So it has to preserve. Now, conformal transformations are interesting, but they're different. Conformal transformations preserve angles. Right angles stay right angles. And this is dramatically different. This changes angles and skews them. So in some sense, maybe one way to say it is that we're trying to match two different geometries. Conformal transformations love to change geometry in a very defined way, and affine transformations do, but they are in agreement, and we have to make them agree. Okay. So anyway, let me see, where am I going here? Um, so are there any questions? I mean, I, I wanted to get this basic idea across to you, and then I'll show you some details. I have a quick question. Yeah, sure, please. So uh, I understand the main point now is that the parameter space for the search is just these three variables. Um, but it, isn't that still a large space, supposing that these could take on continuous values? Is there a constraint 
um, you know, a, a relationship between these three um, uh, that there, can use? there are relations, but um, uh, look, we shouldn't be afraid of doing some uh, uh, machine learning. And machine learning is done usually in an infinite dimensional space. It's certainly um, rather reassuring to do some optimization in three dimensional space. Okay. And remember what this is this is all pre computed. See, once you do this, you find the right geometry. Then you turn on the computer and do, you know, huge Monte Carlo calculations. So this is data to define the parameters in the action. It's actually all, part, some of this has already been done in QCD. Uh, the one affine transformation that people have used in QCD is they'll stretch the time axis different from the space. And they use this in finite temperature. And then they actually do have a coupling constant matching that they have to get to find the relative to actual distance. And that's a quantum distance. So this is called Karsh coefficients. So, you know, when you do this finding, we discovered a few places where this is, this is peaked out of, it's been seen. So Karsh coefficients are an example of calculating a ratio of couplings, which you have to be done in the quantum theory. But it's only a stretching uh, in the, what people like is they want to do the time direction difference. In, in finite temperature, the time direction is the beta. And so if you want to vary beta continuously, rather than just add more lattice spacings, you actually want to stretch it or contract it in that direction. The price you pay is that you lose some of the symmetry. So rotation by 90 degrees from spatial to Euclidean time is no longer good. So actually it introduces a parameter space like this. And it's been, and they, they calculate these things in order to um, get it. And as I say, it's called the Karsh coefficients. It's quite a long calculation. But it's done, at, you, you don't have to do it at the time you're doing Monte Carlo. You can do it afterwards. You can do it either before or afterwards. But I mean, you're right. It's not, it's not trivial, but neither is it daunting. Look, it could have been that in order to get the right geometry, I had to have near, nearest neighbors, next to nearest neighbors, blah, 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 right? I could have had an infinite number of couplings. And so the surprise to us was that it was finite. And I and we now have this sort of heuristic explanation, which I can try to give you why, but okay. So anyway, okay, so now, okay. So the question is now, uh, what do we do with this? So, so we have this solution. Oh, I didn't tell you what L star was because that is a nice geometrical meaning. So I'll go back. Yeah, L star, L star is this distance. You, you take the, the, so this would be L1, L2, L3, for example. And then you take what's called the circumcenter. You take a circle around this triangle and find the center. And then you take the circle around this triangle and find the center. And then if this is L, there's a perpendicular L star. And this, by the way, has to do with a beautiful geometry of simplicial lattices. It's called discrete exterior calculus. There's a whole discrete version of differential geometry. I mean, that's why this Reggie thing and binded elements, when we find that they're the same, they have a very beautiful, long, complicated, exhausting thing to read of discrete exterior calculus. And so this geometry is not arbitrary. And the important thing is to identify not only the points, but what are called the circumcenter or dual points. And so all of the geometry is, I mean, you don't need to know anything beside these points, but if you have this dual point, then you can make these elegant expressions. So these, this elegant expression here of L star is actually um, for this thing, for example, is the way you get what's, what's called the, it's, it's the analog of the Laplacian with the G mu nu. In fact, it's exactly an analog. You can set up a metric tensor on the, on the flat surfaces, and then on the metric tensor, you can replace the continuum metric tensor with that. And then you write a finite difference. And then when you write the finite difference, you discover the weights are L star over L in two dimensions. And it generalizes in higher dimensions. So that's the point is we're not wandering randomly through all possible geometries, okay? There is an elegant geometry in which you have what are called simplices, triangles or tetrahedrons and exponential, and circumcenters of them. Those are called the dual, dual lattice, the circumcenter dual. There are, many, there are many duals. If you read the finite element literature, as I said, you Google it, you'll find 10 million hits, and you'll find that only one out of a million are interesting to read. The problem is to find that one out of a million. <laughs> okay. 
Um, because I'll tell you why, because either it's done by people who are totally into computing approximations and they use it as a part of computer of computation, which is good. I mean, they're successful methods, extremely important method. And then the other people come from the math side and never write down equations. So you have this complete disconnect between the people who use it and have explicit equations. And usually those are buried in their codes. If you go ask them what their equations are, I've done it. They'll say, oh, look, at, download our code. <laughs> oh, yes, that doesn't really help, okay? And then the people who do the elegant geometry say, it's obvious, why don't you read my thing on discrete exterior calculus? Actually, when we, we put them together, first of all, you have to get, I mean, I like that real equations. But furthermore, you find that they actually don't understand each other completely. And sometimes they make wrong statements about each other. So you really have to check the, uh, the far out mathematicians against the far out computer people, make sure that they're actually speaking the same language. And that's been half the problem for this thing is to, is to try to figure out when they're speaking the same language. Okay, anyway, so let me, let me, let me go on and see where this goes. So the, the question, really a little bit to answer your question is, um, okay, so first of all, we check this, and there's actually a wonderful check. It turns out that the icing model on a finite torus can be exactly solved with periodic boundary conditions. In other words, we know it on the infinite plane. That's the icing model, the so-called so conformal field theory, C equals half, central, blah, blah, blah. It's the step, solution of Amsaka, okay? But string theorists, Actually, we're interested in these things on other surfaces. So strings are, are put onto tubes and then the partition function is on a torus and then there's toruses with handles. So string theorists actually wanted to solve two-dimensional conformal field theories on all Riemann surfaces, okay? In particular, there's a specific one and this is a torus here where this is equal to this. So it's periodic. So this thing is equal to this, this is equal to this. But the interesting thing is that when you tilt it by an affine transformation, it is not the same solution. And this is called the modular space. And it's given in terms of these Jacobi functions. This is something I learned in my youth when I was uh, a string theorist. Well, I still am a string theorist, okay? And, the, and so it, the exact solution for the IC model was known on this affine torus. And we can refine it because we now can put triangles in that fit this skewing. Exactly. Interestingly enough, as far as we know, nobody had did this calculation before on the lattice. I don't know why they could. Well, I may be looking. So it turns out that the answer is this, and it's dependent on the skew number here. So this is a complex number. So you can take a triangle, call the base one, just to, just to pick a scale, and then you can um, move this point. It turns out all points in here have a new solution, but if you jump by a, a a wraparound, it's the same solution, and this is called the modular space. It's got to do with a subgroup of the conformal group, which is called the modular group, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, it's all known. It's all been written down. And by the way, these things have been written down for other models. I'm sure that supersymmetric versions of this exist. So we calculated this and we got the right answer. So we had an exact answer of this at a finite lattice, right? We don't have to go to infinity. So that worked. Now, the question, I think, um, Jim? Yeah, Jim. Yeah, I, I think the question which you are asking, uh, which is really um, maybe a little bit ahead of the story, but it's still correct. We wanted to put, we want to, okay, now I want to go away from the flat space. We've solved the flat space in a skewed lattice. The problem is when we took triangles on the edge of an icosahedron and we blew them up onto the surface, the surface was tilted, it's called a tangent plane. So one way to say the reason that our triangles were not exactly the same is that even if they were equilateral here, they would not end up being equilateral there, actually strictly speaking, even as the lattice spacing goes to zero. So actually the way we got into this is we realized that as we scan across this sphere this way, this, these triangles are being, uh, metrically stretched into an affine triangle. I can see you're thinking that's good. <laughs> can you can you picture that? Is it sort of uh, I know this is kind of basic, but 
it does kind of seem like a stereographic projection, but yes, no, it's not. Yeah. It's not basic. You're way ahead of the story. Uh, yes, this is this. It's actually this is actually what's usually called um, a, a part of projective geometry. Uh, this the, the the most yes, it's part of stereographic projection. There's all kinds of projections. Literally speaking, the way you would, would do this in the affine transformation, the way you would do this in, in projective geometry is you would take this to point over to infinity. So the affine transformation is you take another plane and another, actually, you know what it is? It's essentially what the Greeks call conic sections. <laughs> if, I, if I have a cone, right? And I take a slice straight across, it's a circle, right? If I take a slice this way, it's an ellipse. The tilting of the plane to the slice this way is the affine transformation of the circle. Now, it's it, that that is not kept the, the size. Well, the size if you move it back and forth, this side. So actually, yeah, the the conic sections are affine transformations, and it's the tilt of the projection that makes it an affine transformation. You see, it's clear what happens is that as you the, the direction that it's tilted in is stretched, right? Because because the distance from here to here gets gets enlarged if it's more tilted, right? But the distance into the plane, it's hard to draw this thing, doesn't change. I'm talking infinitesimally, okay? I mean, the tangent plane is called is the infinitesimal the tangent plane. Okay, the metric on the tangent plane is a number and it encodes the affine transformation. The difficulty of differential geometry is you have one metric here and one metric here, and then you need a coordinate system to do parallel transport from here to here. And that gets into all of the fancy things of GR, Christoffel symbols and so on, which are all analogous to gauge theories. They're just gauge theories in coordinate space instead of in a group, another group. But anyway, the point is that now, now back to your question, it's a little harder than I claimed. Every point on the sphere is a different affine transformation. Now, in the case that we have the icing model, we have the analytic solutions. We don't even have to find it. We just have to find the shape of the triangle. And on the basis of the shape of the triangle locally, we can find the constants. See, because we have this now this, this closed form. Given the shape of the triangle, which is either L's or the L stars are equivalent, um, sorry, here, we know the constants. Actually, I, I, I didn't show you one thing. We also have to be at the critical point. The critical point satisfies this condition here. That means that at the critical point, we can shrink the distances to zero and still get the right limit. So it's a three parameter space, but um, really only two parameters after you get to the critical surface. So the answer is that for the icing model, we didn't have to guess it. When we went to the sphere, we look at every triangle and we know how to make it critical. So instead of having these blobs, when I first did it, I had these hot spots and cold spots. By using this, we don't have hot spots and cold spots. They're all the same temperature and we can go to the critical point. So now what we've done is we've adjusted the, the thing so that everything is critical simultaneously. That turned out to be almost the solution to the problem, but now it turned out that we still had to worry about the fact that there are three parameters. They're, 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 that, is, that is getting this to match, which is one constraint. By the way, you see this is known because the solution is known analytically. I, we actually, this was a simpler way to write it down. I think we simplified the equations. Um, but so anyway, so this gives you a constraint. If you substitute in the standard thing for say a square lattice, oh, by the way, I should show, see what happens when a, when a lattice is square. Yeah, but what happened to the bond in the middle? That's good. You see, when a lattice is square, then the center of this triangle and the center of this triangle lie on this point. Right, if I put a circle, see a circle goes around the square, right? So the circle is a circumcenter for this triangle and this triangle. So the distance from one to the other is zero. So L star is zero for this. So indeed that bond just disappears. 
So this goes over to the square lattice. So that's why I said the square lattice is really a triangular lattice in a limit. Literally, we take the general solution here, go back to this, and we discover that the answer is that the bond here drops. So we're completely consistent with the square lattice and the triangular lattice and everything in between. Those are just extremes. So anyway, uh, that, that means everything is looking okay. So, um, uh, yeah, okay. So there's a whole, by the way, I, should, I, I mean, you can look at the paper. I don't expect you to understand it here. It turns out the reason we could solve this was a, a trick that um, actually um, Uli Wolf wrote a paper, which was sort of almost all the way to this, the same Wolf of Wolf clusters, but we generalized it. But the, the beautiful thing is that in, in a square lattice, the icing model is famously self-dual. You can, you can use the centers of the squares or the squares and you get the same theory. But in the case of a triangular lattice, the centers of the triangles, uh, every other center forms a hexagonal lattice. So the duality for a triangular lattice, it goes from a hexagonal lattice to, to a triangular lattice. So actually, when you try to solve the problem in the IC model, you have to solve it on both lattices and make them agree. So it's it's technically more complicated, but, but more or less the same. And then there's all kinds of al algebraic identities that you can look up. Um, the fancy ones are called Baxter relations, which don't ask me what they are. I just know that soluble models use Baxter relations. There are books like this that you can read until you go to sleep. Okay, so now what happened? It, we, we, could, we could adjust it so it was critical everywhere. That's good news, but it still didn't work. So, um, so what we had to do, though, is we had to do one other thing. You won't see the difference. These two lattices are different. <laughs> okay. So what's happening? When we adjusted the thing so that it was all critical, we looked at the rotation. We looked at how spherical the um, correlation functions were, in effect, from a point. Remember, we want to make in a, on, a, on a sphere, even though it's on a sphere, if the correlations fall off as arc length, it still should have a correlation function, which makes a spherical cut through the sphere, right? Say the North Pole, it all wants to be at the same place, right? And so we measured the, um, the uh, YLMs, the, the, the rotational properties of the sphere. And what we found was, I say we, this is Evan, Owen, right, principally. What we found is that as we went up in the uh, rotation, these are YLMs, this is L of YLM. We discovered that um, the first three of them Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, zero, one, and two, really the first two that you don't see zero. Um, we're actually very small. Now, this is a good explanation for this because it turns out these first three levels are part of the icosahedral group. And we were very careful to start with an icosahedron and never lose it. So these things are zero up to numerical um, fluctuations. They're all positive, so you don't see them. But so this is what you expect from, from statistics. It, it is actually exactly true for the first two, uh, three levels really, but the first level, zero level is not very important. So, so you see, this means that our statistics can get these error bars. However, when we went above this, we discovered that this by the way is converging for smaller and smaller lattice spacing. If we take the sphere, we can call the sphere radius one as, as Cameron pointed out, that gives you another dimension. And so now we have a definition of lattice spacing, which is use the sphere's radius as a measure, which we can take conventionally to one and then define the lattice spacing relative to that. But what we find is all of these things are not approaching zero. I mean, these are statistics. They're, they're pointing at 1%. They're pretty good, but they're not right. And remember, the reason to have a soluble model is to not be pretty good, okay? But to get it right, okay? because we're trying to learn something about the geometry, okay? So this is wrong. So it turns out that basically, um, well, okay. But basically we had to move the points to improve them. So let me describe this, what you do. Um, there's two parts to this moving of the points. Uh, oh, well, first of all, okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there are two parts. Remember that when the triangles meet, the curvature is always at the vertex, the deficit angle. That means that really you don't see this smooth curvature tensor. The curvature should be a constant everywhere. 
what it is, is it's freckled with de delta functions. And that as you go to finer and finer uh, discretization, it's true that all the delta functions are getting smaller. And then on average, you're getting the same amount of curvature in each area. However, it turns out that's not good enough because of this damn ultraviolet problem that it really knows about the geometry. And it says, you can't fool me. I know the geometry. These delta functions are not all the same strength. So what you do is you can move the points in such a way as you make them equal to the same strength. It turns out that they're always proportional to the dual hexagon around them. So you can make all the hexagons the same by moving the points. And now what you have is not only do you have delta functions, but all delta functions are the same. So it's a density function that's flat. So that's the first thing we did. Then it turns out that that wasn't enough. We also need to have the triangles, neighboring triangles, be smoothly related to the triangles next to it. See, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a coordinate system, okay? And we don't know the coordinate system because Reggie tells us that he writes geometry without coordinates, and he's right. And we write actions without coordinates. So we're in bed with Reggie, we agree. that when we write down things on a lattice, he doesn't know the coordinates from Reggie, and we don't know the coordinates from lattice gates to, or lattice field to. So we're trying to find coordinates. And in order to do that, we have to have smooth affine transformations. So we, we move the points in such a way as to make each triangle's neighborhood so that really when we're on the tangent plane, it becomes a flat affine space. You see, if it, if it fluctuated back and forth, we'd still have problems with ultraviolet. So when we did that, we did both of those smoothing things, which is perfectly okay. Then uh, we got this sphere, which obviously you see is smoother. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't see it, right? This is a better sphere, okay? It's got this smoothing of the triangles from point to point. And then you look at the uh, defect and all of the, de all of the rotational defects are going to zero. So this tells you that this affine space properly controlled is sufficient to solve the IC model on a sphere. I must say, when, when we started this thing, I actually, I, I actually thought there was no solution to this problem. And in fact, uh, I have very good friends who I admire who told me, Richard, you should never do this problem. There's no solution to it. And if it weren't for my wonderful graduate student being persistent and continually running code and telling me that it's looking better, I probably would have given up myself. So this is, in fact, the exact answer to the icing model on a sphere. And we, we need to investigate it more, but we're, we're really confident. Uh, okay, here's the um, another another way to do this on a logarithmic plot. Okay, see, all of the curvature, all of the YLMs are going. So what we've done is we found the coordinate system. Reggie didn't tell us the coordinate system, but we found it. And that actually, by the way, is a very hard problem in geometry that people are still thinking about in general terms. But on a sphere, we found it. Okay, I'm not saying we could do it in general. I mean, I think it can be done in general, but. Uh, Okay, now, why are we doing this? Because I would actually like to make this entire program be equivalent to lattice gauge theory in flat space. I know that cluster algorithms are not always going to be there. So, um, what time did I start? You started yeah. at 1.30. 1.30. Yeah, okay, so I'm, I'm almost through my, my talk and you can go into questions if you want to. Okay, so, so I actually want this complicated geometry to be as simple as possible. Because when you finally get through, what we're doing is we're putting an action on this geometry. But once we've done it, aside from the fact that we have to keep track of the neighbors and, the, and these lengths that we have to determine from a preprocessor, at that point, it becomes the same kind of problem that has been done in flat space, albeit with a different geometry. So I've been talking to Peter Boyle, who is making fantastic codes uh, for QCD. Well, many people have, but he has a, a system called GRID. And so the question is, with all of the wonderful algorithms that are being done in QCD, if we can define the action and the geometry on this lattice, can we find a way to import this data structure into an existing code, which is being designed to go on machines like this, right? 
because we're not going to be able to use cluster algorithms. Cluster algorithms, unfortunately, are a wonderful toy that they really stop as soon as you get away from these simple discrete spin models. I mean, there's been a there's a there's a group of them, and they're very interesting algorithms. They're used they used in large numbers of problems. I don't want to discourage you from learning them. They're extremely uh, uh, capable, but they do not do everything. In fact, um, you can prove that they cannot work. Not, not, no simple modification of this can work for gauge theories, for example. We can basically prove this. So these things are built by our government, paid by all of our taxes, and they're the theorist accelerator, right? And so if we want to use the theorist accelerator, we've got to figure out how to take these kinds of problems and put them on this. Because we really want to do conformal field theories for, for our gauge theories to do beyond the standard model. We have a group doing dark matter near conformal dark matter theories it was, that was discussed uh, yesterday. So we want to be able to mount these kinds of things on these lattices on curved manifolds, either in ADS space or in curved curves or cylinders. They're all they're, they're all constant curvature spaces and they're extremely useful for theoretical investigation and numerical investigation. And we can do non-perturbative stuff if we can turn on a computer and we can get away from soluble models. But we want to use these things. So how do we do that? Oh, here's, by the way, this is the new one that we're now running on called Frontier. This is uh, AMD's um, machine. Th this one is NVIDIA, which is like my t-shirt. <laughs> and this is AMD. Uh, these things are the theorist computational tools. They cost millions of dollars. It would be like a particle experimentalist ignoring CERN to ignore, the, ignore these machines. But it's hard to write code for these machines unless you use code that's already been written 90%. So we're hoping that the change in geometry is not too dramatic. And so here's an example of trying to control the geometry. This is the tetrahedron, I see the icosahedron. Does it look like an icosahedron to you? It is, okay. This point here, here, here are all the North Pole. This point here are all the South Pole. So there are five triangles that go up and hit the North Pole and five triangles that hit the South Pole. But you can put triangles together, one, two, three, four, striping your way from the North Pole down to the South Pole. Notice this one fifth of this thing looks like a regular triangular lattice. No difficulty at all writing code for that. You just do indices, you run straight indices, you write a triangular lattice, it's a periodic triangular lattice. So what you need is five identical triangular lattices. And then every so often you have to realize that these edges are owned by these edges, right? When this North Pole squeezes together, this edge is equal to this edge. And this edge is equal to this. So you have to sew it back together. But what do you do on a big computer? It's called message passing. Once you have a very nice uh, code for a node or a, a sub volume, that's where you get your big uh, boost of, com of computational strength because you can do data parallel thing, you do everything simultaneously, you hit on GPUs, you just go zipping through. The only thing you have is these exceptions, but those can be a message passing. So you can literally ask yourself, say, can I write a lattice, a triangular lattice code in grid? And the answer is yes, we want to do it. It's not there, by the way. Nobuyoki and I and maybe camera who will do it. And then you go in and you say, oh, you have this little message passing library. We dig through there with the help of Peter Boyle, who's the only person who knows where all the bodies are buried. And we change the message passing language. And then we have his code with all of the capabilities of doing hybrid Monte Carlo and inverters and, and uh, fermions and gauge fields and so on all come for free. So it's a very difficult task because the people who wrote these codes never envisioned doing this geometry. So we have to meet them more than halfway. We have to think about how our geometry looks almost like their code. And this is an example for the triangular lattice. Now, if we make it into a cylinder, the rest is very straight. We just drag it down a straight lattice. So we can do uh, three-dimensional theories on a sphere times R. That's very good. We want to go up one dimension because uh, you know, high energy physics is done in four dimensional lattices, space time. So, oh, okay, sorry. So, here's the space time lattice. Okay, so you can ask, what is the most regular 
sphere in one higher dimension. The most regular sphere in two dimensions was the icosahedron. The answer, you can look it up, it's very beautiful. The most regular sphere is called the 600 cell. Now remember, the boundary of this sphere can't be triangles, it has to be tetrahedrons. So 600 tetrahedrons floating around a sphere sphere, in other words, a sphere whose radius is x squared plus y squared plus c squared plus t squared equals a constant, close around to give you a single uh, icosahedral-like structure. It turns out that the symmetries of the three sphere is the Lorentz group. And what you're doing is discretizing SU2 left and SU2 right. What you're doing actually is this is an icosahedral subgroup. This is an icosahedral subgroup. And beautifully enough, the next dimension up is really the product of two icosahedrons. Okay. It has exactly, the icosahedron has 120 uh, symmetries. This thing has 120 squared symmetries. It has 1,440 symmetries. So once we do that, we're, we're, we're flying with three dimensions from the point of view of the icosahedral start. Then you have to refine it. It becomes a little more complicated. It turns out that you'd use an FCC lattice to refine it rather than a triangular lattice, da, da, da. We're working on this, but the, all of this can be done in a quasi domain regular patches. So we believe we can write, we can write data parallel protocol. Uh, so, oh, by the way, it's interesting. The 600 cell was not understood by Aristotle. He made a lot of errors, but he did a lot of good things. It turns out just as in a, in a, um, in a, in an icosahedron, you put five triangles around and you get the least peak, the least defect. If you put six triangles around, it's flat. It's hexagonal lattice, right? It turns out that in this case, you put five tetrahedrons around an edge and the curvature is in that edge. And Aristotle thought if you put five around, it became flat space. He was off by 2%, okay? Because they couldn't do good uh, numerical math in Aristotle's day. And apparently people believed this for, for millennia, okay? So no, it turns out, no, you have to squeeze it a little bit. And if you keep doing it, you don't end up with flat space, you end up with curved space. It's a really, it's really a wonderful analog of, um, and it's a subgroup of the Lorentz group and so on. It's all, by the way, all of these groups are well-known groups. So you don't have to learn a lot of the group theory. Um, the um, conformal group in two dimensions is, is the Minkowski space Lorentz group, 031, comma one. So all the groups come up over again and you can learn it without much effort. Oh, and by the way, uh, just to show you that geometry is important, I found that uh, Dirac came to BU. And I don't know if you, if anybody has an image of Dirac, but he was one of the most taciturn physicists. And he wrote down beautiful equations and, and basically said, here's my equation, read it. This is what it understands. He was known to not have many words and certainly never wrote a paper with any diagrams. He, he, he wrote down the Dirac equation, a wonderful geometric, uh, you know, algebraic thing. However, he came up to BU with Penrose and they had a come clean Dirac meeting in which they said, really Dirac, how do you think about this stuff? <laughs> and he said, of course I use geometry. <laughs> do you think I'm silly? And here is a picture from his notebooks. This is projective geometry. This is, the, you were asking about projective geometry. This is the projective, see, by the way, this is a tetrahedron. These are, these are projective triangles. This is from his notebook. So Dirac secretly, not telling his friends, he was sitting scribbling in his notebook, all of this geometry. I don't know if he was embarrassed about it or didn't want to tell people his secret weapon, okay? So don't neglect geometry. It's not the same as writing a code. You will not be able to solve equations from geometry, but you will be able to think. And that's why I go back to Hilbert. Hilbert said, think geometry, write equations. Or, or as computational physicists, we say, Think geometry, write programs. Programs are good at doing algebra, and we're very slow at doing algebra, but we are very fast doing geometry. So the answer to uh, Dirac anyway, and I'm willing to follow Dirac and Hilbert's uh, example, is think geometry, okay? And then write algebra, and then write programs, okay? So I was very amused by that.
And oh yeah, I have lots of backup slides, which I won't show you. I mean, this is just to show we can deal with these are finite elements for higher fields. We, uh, you know, we're not we're not staying in this small sandbox. But um, I won't. Here, here is the actual um, uh, numerical results from phi four theory on a sphere. These are old results, but everything is with you know with a few things. So we actually do calculations. I only put these backup chat slides to show you that we really do write down equations. We're not just waving our hands, but waving our hands. Okay. Anyway, that's that's the end of my talk. So um, if you have questions, that's fine. Otherwise, you can. Oh yeah, I was gonna. This is for Joel's um, benefit. Okay, good. I was, I was, I was hoping you would mention the. Yeah. Okay. So we've been doing the two well potential, but there is this thing called the three well potential. All you have to do is you add to phi fourth a phi six term, and now the phi six term stabilizes it, and the phi fourth term becomes a relevant parameter. So now there's two relevant parameters: the mass and the phi fourth term. And if you adjust them very carefully, you can get a three well potential in which the uh, vacuum in each of these potentials is the same. I mean, actually, you have to be careful about quantum effects, but basically, there is a tuning now, but it's a tuning not of just a mass, but another parameter. And in fact, you have to tune what we call K or beta, and you have to tune this. And but just like the IC model, you don't have to stick with phi four theory. You can think of three states that it's either minus one, plus one, or zero. So the supersymmetric icing model is written with only one small change. These S's now go from one to zero to minus one. Now, obviously when it's zero, it doesn't change this term at all. It changes the entropy because there's more states. So you have to put another term in, which favors the thing being, um, disfavors it being one. When this is zero, then it's favored. And when it's one, this term drops out. So what this term is doing is uh, changing the, the well in between. If you're very careful and now tune this and this tune together, you will go to what's called the tricritical point. And at that tricritical point, magically it becomes the next minimal model, which is also completely solved, called the tricritical model. And if you really wanna know more about the tricritical model, you should go read Cameron's thesis because that's what he actually did for his PhD was study the tricritical model in one case, okay? But we can do that as well. So the next most complicated model, in fact, probably the only one that's really interesting is to write this sizing model with two parameters. It's more complicated because you have more states. You have to tune two parameters. So it, it challenges a little bit our thought of how many parameters there are. I think they're gonna be two relevant parameters and then we'll get down to the three affine parameters. I think that's the way it'll work. And then you can, then there's these wonderful things that, you know, there's a tricritical point, it can run off to a Gaussian theory, it can run off to an icing point. You can vary these parameters until you um, spend your whole career in this thing, uh, finding out all of the phases. If that's not enough, you can add terms which break the uh, Z2 symmetry, S goes to minus S, the magnetic terms and, and other terms. These things turn into massive theories. They have mass spectrums that are exactly known. These spectrums form gigantic groups, E7, E8. And there is more mathematics about this than, than is good for your health, but everything is known about it again, okay? So uh, the icing, uh, and there's field theories for this thing. The field theory is, what is it called? The, um, oh, remind me of the field theory, Joel. Joel's not here. Yeah, the West Zumino model. West Zumino model. Yeah. The field two D West Zumino model. Yeah. So the West Zumino model has a fermionic field and a bosonic field. So it's the it's the sort of phi fourth version of it, except for now because there's an extra state and it's supersymmetric. So the way I think about this, and I think it's basically correct, is that the icing model can be thought of as a fermion flipping from this well to this well, because the icing model is secretly a free fermion inside. So there's a fermionic kink, which then takes you from one side to the other. And then there's a boson that sits here. And if you tune them together, you can get the boson and the fermion to have the same mass and then go to the critical point and you get a, a supersymmetric model. So there are many theories, to, but let me tell you, you could spend a huge amount of time understanding this theory. Uh, we have people in, uh, in BU who are doing this in Minkowski space. We could also put this on a quantum computer. You could turn these things into spin matrices for a Hamiltonian. So the next 
interesting, I would say, theory beside the icing model, which is already very interesting, is the supersymmetric icing model. And it, it, it's it's very intuitive. It's just this. This is called the um, um, Bloom Chappell. Bloom Bloom Chappell model uh, version. You see, because of go back to my original thing, because of universality, there's never going to be one way to write down these models. There's going to be many ways, which are equivalent when you get to the continuum and or conformal limit. So. Uh, Cameron had a whole different spin model that he used for this thing. Actually, Cameron in his thesis was trying to do something even weirder. He was trying to glue an icing model to a tricritical model and see what happened at the boundary, um, which is very interesting. But anyway, so, I mean, there, there's just many other models to, to study. I think actually um, uh, here is, um, uh, well, yeah, here is, I, I, the list can go on. I haven't really decided what is the most important list, but. Let me see, I think, um, yeah, I mean, okay. Another model, by the way, which is very interesting is um, uh, three-dimensional QED. It turns out this is a very important model for condensed matter physicists. There's a conformal fixed point and nobody's really sure what its nature is. So we can do this. This requires U1 gauge theories and fermions. Um, we can do three spheres, I mentioned that. We can do three across this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is, to learn step by step <laughs> and then talk to condensed matter physicists because they actually want the solutions of these problems. So they're not, uh, there's experimental, there's a lot of experimental information on these models. Okay, anyway, um, I've talked too long probably, but any other questions? I hope this was helpful in, in giving you a feeling for the, uh, the problem space. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think this is a, an interesting set of problems because you know, the, the five fourth and the easing model are so accessible, you know, the, some of the gauge theory stuff, you, you really get lost in the mechanics of it sometimes, but you, you know, like, like this group that was able to put together a five fourth model, you know, in, a, in just a couple of weeks. Um, so I guess, yeah, that's, that's something, uh, you know, if you could suggest them or, or me some, some little thing. What is what is an interesting little mini project that you could do well, I, with five? I'll, even, I'll mention a couple now, but we can all obviously talk offline and, and zoom and so on. But I mean, one we have we, we have several questions um, that are immediately uh, posing us. One is the one that Cameron and uh, no, Norioki and I are, are beginning to look at, and that is uh, we have these three parameters: k one, k two, k three. And this is actually relates to this question that the um, referee asked us. We know that we have to coordinate them to get to a critical point. And that gets you down to uh, two parameters. And then what he said is it's not accidental that that's the case. Because when you do that, the energy momentum tensor is traceless. Well, an energy momentum tensor is a symmetric two by two matrix, right? So it starts off with three parameters. If you make it traceless, it has two. And then he said something which we sort of knew, which is essentially, remember that the energy tensor is conjugate to the uh, metric. So what you really had to do was adjust the metric to get rid of this extra uh, term in the, the action which you didn't want. And I think he's right, so we're testing that. And so we can find out how to relate the energy anthem tensor to the parameters K1 to K3. So that's one problem. The, another problem, which I think is in a way even deeper, is you notice that the, um, the finite element was almost the same for the free theory as the IC model. So let, let me just make this point. So, and, and, but we haven't really explored this thing. It's really, there's a renormalization group question here. Yeah, so you see, the free theory is this fixed point here. And yet, on a affine lattice, we know that this is equal to the, the k two k equals l star over l. Up here is the strong coupling point for the um, IC model, and what you're doing when you go there is you're you're introducing more and more phi uh, fourth term. So this must be sort of renormalization group flow. Oh, this this has got shifted off. Oh, I'm sorry, this is not much of a when I was doing it, these laxes should be there. Okay, all right, okay. So 
what we believe is that this formula that we have for the Ks is actually a function of the lambda parameter. And that it starts off life looking like the free theory. And that there's a function that as lambda goes to infinity, and you see what happens when lambda goes to infinity. Yeah, here it is. When lambda goes to infinity, you see what happens? With right tuning, it forces phi to be plus or minus one. So we believe that there's a renormalization group flow from the ultraviolet up to the infrared. That's not news, that's something that everybody writes down in a cartoon. But we think that we can track the affine parameters from one to the other. Now that could be, you could try to do that numerically and see if that's true. It sounds very plausible, but you know, there's a lot of guesses here. So uh, I think that's, those are both problems just in the triangular lattice on that affine plane, which is very simple code. Um, I guess the next set of problems would be um, possibly to start looking at the supersymmetric model. So, you know, you have to get your, your feet on the ground, but the first thing would be to go to the affine plane and repeat this thing for this slightly, it's only, it's, you know, what we do is what we did for the icing model, except we use this action. Now it's a little more complicated because first of all, we, I don't know, that's a good question whether we know the analytic solution. It's probably known. There's some, so, I mean, if people can read uh, oceans and oceans of, of mathematical literature, you can probably find it. But there is a point here which requires tuning K and delta simultaneously. But nonetheless, we could numerically do it just as one does the uh, thing. So this is, just an, this is just a regular lattice. This could be a triangular square lattice. So one thing is to try this thing and get to this point and then try to show that we are literally getting the, um, this I'm sure it's been done. And I know it's been done. This could be done on a regular lattice to see, see the supersymmetric point. Then the point is to then do an affine transformation and see if we can move away from that point to these general triangular lattices at supersymmetry. Eventually, our hope is we would do that and then eventually we go back to the sphere and put the supersymmetric theory on a sphere. Very cool, very cool. So, you know, these now we sort of have a roadmap. You sort of take what we've done in the icing model and crawl along that roadmap step by step. Okay. <laughs>